Gouven Guzeldeer is uh, a colleague of Owens at Duke, and uh, in talking to him last night, he was telling me that he's working in the area of cognitive science and religion at this point. Uh, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. For the last couple of years, I've been uh, teaching a, a course called the Cognitive Science of Religious Belief, and have been using materials of some of the uh, participants of this conference, including uh, Owen Flanagan, A.C. Grayling, Pat Churchland, uh, Sam Harris, and some of the uh, participants from uh, previous years. So it's a pleasure to be here uh, this year. Um, I'm interested in eudaimonia, uh, and, and some of it uh, is born out of conversations that I've had over the years with uh, Owen. Um, but I'm more interested in the exploration of non-theistic conceptions as well as practices of human flourishing. Uh, this interest um, emerged partly by accident in a class that I was teaching in philosophy of mind some uh, years ago. Uh, as you know, the classical artificial intelligence paradigm put in a lot of emphasis on abstract thinking processes and not on how embodied agents do what they do in the world. And in, this, in that context, we're talking about the, the possibility of disembodied cognition and what that would amount to and what the the new, the, the more recent wave of embodied cognition uh, brought into cognitive science. Now, this embodied cognition brings into the possibility of, well, it's, it's relevant to a discussion of uh, the possibility of afterlife. If you believe in, uh, as it turns out, on average, 80% of our Duke students uh, do uh, in, in the possibility of a, and a disembodied afterlife. I think it's a fair question to ask what kind of a cognitive mental life uh, could you expect out of that disembodied existence. Um, I discovered that that question uh, raises more anxiety than anything else that I was ever able to uh, bring about in class, not that I particularly try to raise anxiety in, in my students, but it really got them hooked into, in, into the, the discussion. So eventually, um, uh, as I found it more and more striking how theistic conceptions uh, played a very important central uh, role in the lives of our students, uh, I got interested in, in the idea of exploring theistic as well as non-theistic conceptions of uh, human uh, flourishing. Um, that's how the cognitive science of religious belief, the, the, the course that I now teach, uh, came about. I teach that course in a study abroad program in Turkey. Uh, we actually uh, take a long tour all uh, over Asia Minor and trace the steps of the, the emergence of Christianity and, and various Judaic groups as, as, well as, um, uh, as well as Islam. Turkey is very interesting. That's where I grew up. Um, in the elementary school that I went to, there were huge signs, as it was the case in most other elementary schools, proverbs by the founder of the Turkish Republic, uh, Kemal Atatürk, that said, science is the only true guide in life. Um, now, that was meant to, to replace a theistic conception of uh, uh, guiding in life. And Turkey being, I think, one of the most ambitious and impressive and somewhat utopian uh, modernization projects of the uh, 20th century, tried to, to, to have science as a substitute for the place for, for, uh, of God or, or, or religion in the flourishing of the members of its new republic. Um, I can't say that it was uh, completely successful. There is actually a, a turn towards the more religious uh, practices and, and habits of life in Turkey of the uh, early 21st century. Uh, that in itself is an interesting question. I don't want to uh, talk about that uh, in this talk, but I want to mention uh, two things that I take from the um, the excursions that, that we make, uh, looking at the, the emergence of the three Abrahamic religions in the region in, in Asia Minor, one is the really humbling, enormous effort uh, that was put in 
to, that was made to establish all three, the Judeo-Christian and Islamic worldviews in terms of its symbolic forms, art, architecture, um, uh, culture, as well as practices of communal living. It really is very impressive. Um, the second is that it is impressive uh, in such a way that it tells me that the success of the prevalence of, of those three religions is actually invariant with respect to there being a metaphysical supernatural trigger or a sustaining force. That is, you put in that much work and effort um, in a project, it will become as successful as, as, as these three religions uh, have been in, in promoting their word. Um, it, I'm not going to try to defend that. I just wanted to put it as, as uh, something that I, I take from uh, these excursions over the last uh, couple of years. And I want to come back to the, the context of human flourishing and the non-theistic conceptions and, and practice of, practices of it, especially because I, as uh, I know many of you are in the business of um, shaping the lives of young people at a very crucial stage in their lives, uh, you know, 18 to 22, uh, something like that. Um, in this context, I think it's really important to distinguish between two dimensions of um, religious belief and what follows from it, as well as efforts aimed at this uh, flourishing project. Um, one effort, one dimension, has to do with expanding horizons of knowledge and understanding, understanding of the world, understanding of others, understanding of self. Uh, that's more a cognitive epistemic project. Then there's the uh, effort of changing practices of living, uh, social, communal, interpersonal practices. That seems, now these two efforts are very related in that I think the latter is rooted in the former. But I think it's important to realize that they are directed at very different groups and they have very different timelines. Um, and they apply very differently. Um, I want to expand the horizons of my students in my class who have just come from high school and 80% of them believe in uh, supernatural forces and afterlife and, and these are the kinds of forces that shape their lives. I don't similarly want to expand or try to expand the horizons of my grandmother, who has religious beliefs, and uh, I don't, you know, maybe when I was 14, I thought truth and nothing but the, the truth is the only thing that needs to be um, revealed to everyone and so forth. I no longer think that. Um, it, it, there is a lot of work that comes from the forceful pens of uh, authors such as uh, Dennett, Dawkins, Hitchens, and so forth, that I see as targeting the first project, the epistemic cognitive project. And I think that project is extremely uh, important. I see a lot of criticism uh, that that effort is really not uh, aiming at or, or doing anything good about the second project, changing the practices uh, themselves uh, rather than the, the cognitive horizons. Um, but I think that's unfair because I think it's perhaps, uh, as William James said, uh, habits are the most, the, the, the strongest forces that shape our lives. And it's, it's perhaps um, impossible to change certain habits of living uh, for perhaps the current generation. But I also think it's perhaps unnecessary. Um, we all know the famous quote from Marx where he says religion is the opium of the mass masses. Uh, that's often misread as him trying to say that opium, uh, religion is there to blur and cloud the uh, senses and, and minds of the masses so that they can't see the truth and so forth. He actually didn't mean it in that way. If you read it in context and if you take into account the fact that opium was used in the 18th century as a painkiller uh, more than anything else. He really means it, uh, he really means religion is there to 
soothe the anxieties and the existential pain of the masses, the, the, the kind of anxieties and pain that come from, uh, and that can be changed by changing the basal conditions of labor and, and production and, and so forth. Um, uh, on exactly that point, um, I think that um, while perhaps changing habits of living and practices uh, and trying to establish a non-theistic uh, uh, form of living practices uh, is not an e easy job or, or perhaps an impossible one at that. It is very possible to, to change the epistemic cognitive grounds in which such practices um, are based for future generations. Um, I think it is possible to establish non-theistic practices that involve community sharing, camaraderie, and the good um, uh, that are much more promising and, and fulfilling than their theistic uh, alternatives or, or conceptions, f again, for the future generations. And that, I see, lies uh, in the epistemic ground. And that's the project that I'm currently interested in exploring. Thank you.